Um, with regard to, and I think this is where you guys, or the people in London anyway, are way ahead of us in Sydney. You have a philosophy of reading the Bible one-to-one. -one. Now, that's what they do in London, which is incredibly impressive. We don't do that hardly at all in Sydney, but I think that's really good. And that book on Romans, The 50-Day Guide, gives you the reading on Romans, it gives you a comment, and then it gives you questions for discussion. So reading the Bible with a new convert is a great thing to do um, and uh, just get material. So there, there's material in there on Acts that can help you with that, but certainly that material on Romans can help you with that as well. At my son's wedding, he got married in South Africa and uh, there was a South African evangelist married my son and my son's best man was a Buddhist. And at the end of the service, he said to me, his name was Ka Ken Wong, he said, Mr. Cook, I think I've become a Christian during that service. I said, well, that's great, Ka Ken. Um, he said, would you read the Bible with me when we get back to Australia? So we had a year of just reading the Bible on a Wednesday night together. And I think it was, it was rich for me because I kept saying things to him and he was amazed. And I thought, well, of course this is true. It's you take it for granted. But he was amazed at things that I was taking for granted. So it's great to be able to be reading the Bible one-on-one -on -one to people. Okay, let's have a look at this now, just to finish the day. A bit lighter now. This is called the Preaching Preparation Pyramid. I know it's not a pyramid, I know it's a triangle, uh, but that doesn't quite go. Um, now, uh, some difficulties I had was when I first came to our college 26 or 27 years ago, I had to teach preaching. There was no one else to do it. I was a church historian. Um, but as I started to teach preaching, I realised that that's really what I wanted to be doing. Um, it was funny teaching preaching because when you'd been preaching, you just do it. And so uh, I think sometimes you say, well, how can you teach someone to preach? You just say, well, do it. Just do it. I just do it. I just naturally do it without thinking about the constituent parts of doing it. And the important thing for me when I was asked to teach preaching was to break down what I did into its different parts. Now, that's what this represents. Now, it may well be the way you preach is individual to you and the way you prepare is individual to you. And so all I can say is this is individual to me as my fingerprint and what I'm going to say may not suit you at all. You've just got to work out the best way it works for you. But maybe by hearing what I am saying, uh, it could be helpful to you in your own preaching preparation. Notice the obvious thing about this pyramid. It's widest at the base and it comes to a narrow peak at the top. So all our preparation is leading upwards. Notice that one of the first things we'll do is look at context, twofold context. Bible, uh, context in the Bible, context in the book. Okay, so if we're in Acts, where are we in Acts and how, what is the flow of Acts from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth? I want to know where we are in the book and I want to know where the book is in the whole flow of salvation history. So what is salvation history? I had a lady in our first congregation, she said, tell me what the Bible's all about in one sentence. I said, oh, that's very difficult to do. Haven't you been trained? Yes, I said, I've been trained. So tell me what the Bible's all about in one sentence. Right, so here's the Bible. You've got creation, you've got rebellion, you've got exclusion, okay? So that's the first three chapters, but pretty much we're halfway there. You've got God entering into relationship with Abraham and Abraham's people. You've got, but them failing the covenant obligations. You've got Jesus coming to the rescue and God entering into relationship with all those who are Jesus' people. And then you've got the final judgment. All right, so six things, right? Creation, rebellion, expulsion, old covenant failure, new covenant perfection, the day of the Lord is coming. Now, that's six things, all right? Now, that's simplified. Now, you work out where we are in that. We are in that. The book of Acts is new covenant having been established. We are now between the establishment of the new covenant and the great final day of the Lord, the day of judgment, all right? So that's, that's salvation-wise where I am. Now then, I come to the foot and I start here and I start summarising the passage in my own words in point form with verse reference. 
So I want to make sure that what I am summarising there is actually what the passage says. Now, two things. My background is in economics. I worked for the Reserve Bank of Australia, which is like the Bank of England. I had to summarise every day the Wall Street Journal and the London Financial Times, every article relating to world commodity markets. And the Reserve Bank sent me away for two weeks to train me to be a summariser. Now, they were training me to be a preacher, in actual fact. Now, what is the key about a summary? A summary does not say everything in the original article. So you're making a judgment, you're cutting it down. And secondly, a summariser does not interpret. Now, this is the most difficult one for a preacher because when you look at the biblical text, you immediately jump to interpretation. Don't interpret. Just put down what the text says. So point one verse reference, point two verse reference, point three verse reference. All right? And uh, you may well, in your summary, you may well uh, have, uh, say, 20 verses and you've summarised them in five main points. Then you move up. So we're moving up and you come to the movements in the passage. Can you clump the movements together? Take Acts 1 as an example. Uh, Acts 1, verses 1 to 8. You've got the wait for the Spirit to come. Verses 9 to 11, you've got Jesus ascending into heaven. Verses 12 to 20, you've got Judas and understanding his, uh, the issue of Judas and his denial of Christ. And then you've got Matthias 21 to 26. So you've clumped the chapter together into four sections. 1 to 8, 9 to 11, 12 to 20, 21 to 26. And so if you're going to preach a sermon on Acts chapter 1, you'll probably have four points. So your movements is you are boiling down the material into their main constituent parts. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved that he gave, he believed. So as a preacher, I'm training myself to summarise things. So the other day I sat down and had morning tea with Dick Lucas. We spoke for one and a half hours and at the end of the conversation, he said, right, he said, brother, we have said two things of import here. One, two. Now that's the preacher, isn't it? Summarising. That's what the sub-editor does in the newspaper. Here's the headline. This is what this really is about. And so you're sitting down and you're summarising. You're breaking it down. Why? Because I guarantee you, if you are a young preacher... Your biggest problem is you are saying too much. That's your biggest problem if you're a young preacher. You're saying too much. So I was in London and a young lady came up to me and said, uh, we're newlyweds, I don't know how to tell my husband, but he preaches far too long. <laughs> I said, well, you choose your time very wisely. That's my only <laughs> advice to you. But it's, it's the problem, isn't it? You've just got too much material. You've got too much to say. Summarise, summarise. All right, then we come to the dominant picture. Is there a dominant picture in the passage? Um, uh, Warren Wearsby in his book on preaching says, he quotes McNeil Dixon, that philosophers' arguments are wrong. The human brain is much more a picture gallery than a debating hall. Now, we are working in the debating hall when we should be working in the picture gallery. Ravi Zacharias in his latest book says, how do you reach a culture which hears with its eyes and thinks with its emotions? Well, you do it the way Jesus did it. So the young man comes to Jesus and says, who are you? And Jesus says, I'm the eschatological manifestation of the ground of your being. I am the charisma in which you find the fulfilment of your deepest interpersonal needs. It's not what he said at all, is it? Who are you? I'm the bread of life. I'm the living water. I'm the good shepherd. Jesus spoke in images. How do you reach a society which hears with its eyes and thinks with its emotions? You reach them with pictures. What is a picture? A parable. A parable. Uh, he is like a tree. He is like chaff which the wind blows away. So you've got that in mind. Is there a picture in this text that I am seeing here? I'm not trying to be creative. I'm not wanting to inject a picture. But when it comes to um, narrative, I think it's vitally important to find if there is a dominant picture here in the text. 
All right, subject. What is the writer talking about? Compliment. What is he saying about what he is talking about? Now put those two together and that gives you your big idea. What is he talking about? Uh, he's talking about the pure gospel, Acts chapter 15. What is he saying about the pure gospel? The pure gospel does not include anything beyond faith in Jesus. Uh, the pure gospel does not add conditions of circumcision. The pure gospel is faith in Christ alone. There's a big idea, right? And then we come to the big question, what, when, where, why, how, who? And therefore, every sermon that I am writing is answering a big question. And it's either the question which is obvious in the text or the question which is below the surface of the text. It's the implied question of the text. <coughs> so every statement of scripture is answering a question. So, for example, my name is David Cook. Question, what is your name? Uh, I've been married 41 years. How long have you been married? Uh, I have five children. How many children do you have? I have 12 grandchildren. How many grandchildren do you have? Every statement is answering a question. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is the question being answered? How does God love the world? Uh, what does God's love mean? How can I have eternal life? So every time I stand up to preach a sermon, what keeps Paul going through the various jurisdictions of his litigation uh, must be the question which the text is answering. And if you don't answer, ask a question, then your people will think you are simply dumping knowledge on them. So I think that's one of the biggest complaints I hear in Australia that we're being lectured to and I don't know why I'm hearing this material because there's no obvious question being answered. Uh, one bloke said to me, he recently heard a sermon on how do I discover the prophetic perspective in the prophet Hosea. Man, who cares? I mean, really, if you think that is a relevant question for the average person in the pew, you've got to think again. You've been to theological college too long. What is the question of Hosea? How can I know that God's love is unconditional and he will never let me go? That's a better question. Show me that because I want unconditional love. Right, so what is your question being answered, all right? Now, notice this. Uh, this is very, a very quick overview, but I'm just saying at this point I've read and reread and reread the passage. I've observed the passage. I've observed the moods of the verbs. I've observed the uh, imperatives, I've observed the repetitions, I've put it into its context. I'm trying to reflect the emotion of the passage. You see, every passage has an emotion. How can I get hold of that emotion and reflect the emotion? Galatians chapter 1, let him be eternally condemned. I'll say it again, if anybody brings a gospel to you other than that which you heard from us, let him be eternally condemned. That's very heavy and that's quite emotional. The Lord laughs from heaven, that's quite emotional. The father sees the son coming. He lifts his robes and runs to his son and sweeps him off his feet. That's very emotional. And those who therefore say that God is an unemotional God don't read their Bibles. But I want to read my Bible in such a way that I discover the emotion of the text. And I'm reflecting the emotion of the text. Now what I haven't done yet is that I haven't looked at a commentary. Um, and I just want to say this, and hear me carefully here, commentaries are poisonous if you look at the commentary too early in the process of preparation. We are not Roman Catholics. We are not Roman Catholics. And so God hasn't decreed that I should understand scripture and the intermediary between God and me is Don Carson or F.F. F. Bruce. That I cannot come to the text of scripture and it's not clear I need to actually place the commentary over the Bible and read the commentary. Now it's foolish if I neglect the commentary but I need to do it in a proper order. So for me, if I'm preparing Monday to Friday, I don't look at the commentary till Thursday because I'm the sort of person, if you, if you give me the answer to the question, I won't think about the question anymore. But if I'm in the passage and I'm thinking about this, it's a really healthy thing and I'm talking to people about it and I'm prayerfully considering about it in the light of the Holy Spirit in me. 
So I want you to hear me rightly. You should get your commentaries, but my view is don't look at them too early. It was interesting when I was involved in London at St Helens in the apprenticeship scheme there, and they were critiquing two sermons of two young men. Each young man preached for 15 minutes. We then spent two and a half hours critiquing the poor coots. Now, you just imagine that. If you preached for 15 minutes and then someone critiqued you for an hour and a quarter, oh, when is it going to stop? What I found so helpful about that, no one mentioned a commentary. We were taking the person back to the text itself, all the time looking at the text. And that's what we must be driving each other back to the text. Okay, now I'll stop there before I deal with the two biggest issues a preacher faces, because I'm sure you want to make a contribution at this point. Right, I'm wrong, am I? You don't want to make a contribution. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's good. So you're taking your summary, and that's your summary of your summary. Okay, that's your summary of your summary. So your summary already cuts things down, and your movements cut your summary down. Yeah, Acts chapter 1. Okay, so if you, were to, if you were to summarize Acts chapter 1, you might come out with, say, 15 points of summary, right? And the movement just clumps them together. 1 to 8, 9 to 11, 13 to 21, 22, etc. Okay, so do you want another example? No? Okay, good. All right, yes. I'm trying to get down to the question which I think the passage is answering. Now, the question is, can the passage be answering a number of questions? Yes, it can. John 3.16 is a good example. Uh, how do I know God loves the world? How can I have eternal life? Um, those, are, those are two legitimate questions. And so a passage can be answering a number of questions, but what you've got to have ultimately end up with is a question that you are happy that the passage is answering in the most direct way. So what I'm saying is that every passage of Scripture will be answering a question. So, Acts chapter 12 starts with Herod in the ascendancy, Herod eaten by worms and died, James' head comes off, Peter is released from prison in response to the prayers of the church, the church and their unbelieving prayer. Right? Herod fails to give glory to God and therefore he's eaten by worms and died. Now what's all that about? It's all about the sovereignty of God where Herod's political power is being pitched against the spiritual power of God. Who's in control? Who is sovereign? Is there a hidden hand at work? Any of those things can be a legitimate question, I think, ans answered by chapter 12. Okay, uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, uh, do things have, have a, a, a chance, luck way of working out or is God in control of all things? Go south to the road, go now south to the road, go to that chariot and stay near it. He's reading Isaiah 53. There's an intersection takes place. Yes. I'm sorry, do Yes, I always start with a question first. All right, I'm drawing a question from the text and generally I'll go to the question first that I've drawn from the text. I, wa I want to make sure that the question is the question which the text answers. See, the best way that I know I've got the subject is put it to the test of a compliment. If I say Acts 12 is about marriage, well, what does Acts 12 say about marriage? Nothing, so it can't be about marriage. If I say that Acts 12 is about sovereign power and control, yes, it says a lot about that. So that's probably what the subject is. Now then, when I've got my question that comes from my subject compliment, big idea, big question, I then got to spend a good deal of time at the start of the sermon establishing why the question is relevant. So when I, when I left Sydney, I got on an A380 to fly to Heathrow. Where was, the pa where was the maximum power necessary for that plane? To get it off the ground, it was full of fuel, full of people, full of baggage at Sydney. Maximum thrust to get it up. When it's up there, it just floats along, which pilots tell you it does, and then you've got to stop it at Heathrow. So therefore, here and here, 
Intro and conclusion is where I need maximum power. Now, a guy did a questionnaire of his congregation in Sydney at morning tea, 15 minutes after they'd heard the sermon. And everyone was asked, what can you remember about the sermon which you heard 15 minutes ago? Most people can say, I remember the first thing the preacher said, the last thing he said, and any major errors he made in between. Now, therefore, if they're listening first and last, I want to get in that first and last. And I want somehow to engage them on the question. Now, therefore, to engage them, and I find over here, there's this false view that you divorce yourself from your preaching. And I just don't think you'll ever be able to preach in Australia if that's the case. Because in Australia, I want to know how this works for you, and I want to know something about you. I don't want, I'm not American. I don't want you to dominate. But I do want to know something about you and this text. So I told you, for example, my wife are reaching empty nest syndrome, and that, that was a way in. I told you that we had children and that we're now empty nesters. And so somehow, I think you've got to find a way of engaging me in the introduction by telling me about how it works for you. I found uh, a few years ago, I heard an English preacher, a very well-known English preacher, and he preached for 50 minutes, an excellent expository sermon, and I found it very unsatisfying at the end because at the end I knew nothing more about him than I did at the beginning. He was the blank man. And I don't think that's the way it ought to be. I don't think we should dominate but I think I, as a preacher, am human with a particular personality and that should find its way, truth through personality, in the preaching. And it does, doesn't it? In, in Luke, you can see his personality coming through. And it does in Mark. You know, and it does, yeah, so, you know, the Greeks sit around doing nothing but speaking about the latest ideas all the time. That's where the Greek financial crisis comes from, Acts chapter 17. Yes. When you said you don't take the concept of Yeah. What 